this is Tanner Dykin, pastor at Open Door Baptist Church in Mayfield, Kentucky. Uh, last Wednesday night, our uh, audio uh, for the uh, sermon uh, did not go out live, and uh, so I'm uh, making a replacement recording uh, for what we talked about there. Uh, I've got a limited time to, to do this this evening before uh, our Wednesday night service tonight, and uh, so I'll uh, uh, likely be abbreviating a little bit what we talked about. So uh, just to uh, get back to where we were, uh, we ended our first study of the book of Hebrews uh, in chapter 4 and verse 13. Uh, the, uh, the, the content that we looked at before uh, was about how Christ is uh, better than uh, the uh, angels, how he's better than the promise that was given or the, the, the covenant that was given to uh, Moses, uh, how he was the uh, uh, fulfillment of the tabernacle, the rest of Moses, as the, the uh, passage puts it, uh, that is the reign of God in his creation. Uh, and uh, we saw several warnings given uh, that because Christ is uh, better than the uh, angels and thus better than uh, Moses and uh, the, the law that was given to Moses by the angels, uh, that uh, therefore we should take heed uh, not to overlook Christ and not to ignore what he is, uh, what he is revealing and, and the uh, mediation that he gives on our behalf. And so uh, we ended in chapter 4 and verse 13. Next, what we're going to see is that the priest, while the priesthood of uh, Levi, the, the priesthood that was given through uh, Moses to uh, Aaron and to his sons, uh, while that was a, a good priesthood, uh, nonetheless, Christ's priesthood far exceeds that priesthood in its efficacy. And so, uh, beginning reading in verse 14, we read, Seeing then we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The, uh, uh, the um, uh, fact uh, that, that, that the, uh, the rest of of Christ, that Christ will give to his people rest, uh, implies that he has a priestly service that he does. Uh, his tabernacle is greater than Moses, and so his service in the tabernacle is also greater than the service that went on in Moses' tabernacle and in the temples throughout the uh, uh, history. Uh, it, it says that the we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Uh, this is setting us up for uh, something that's going to have that's going to be be talked about here in a moment. But because Christ, uh, as we read earlier, uh, did not take on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham, because of that, he is able to identify with our weakness as humans, and as such. He is able to, to perfectly represent us before God because he knows our infirmities. He can, he can sympathize with us as our mediator. Chapter 5 and verse 1. For every priest, high priest, taketh from among men, is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant? and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity, and by reason whereof uh, hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that uh, is called of God was uh, as was Aaron. Uh, so just as we said a moment ago, it says that the every high priest is taken from among men, and the reason for that is because they can have compassion. They can, they, they can identify with our weakness in the flesh, and they can have compassion towards us. In the same way Christ did this for us. Uh, he took on flesh, 
Uh, he was tempted in the wilderness and yet without sin. Uh, and so uh, he is able to identify with our infirmities as he also was a man with infirmities. But the last uh, verse there in verse 4, No man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. Uh, priests do not make themselves priests. They are called to be priests. Uh, no one uh, approaches to God to do the office of a priest. God approaches to the man to, to call him to be a priest. Uh, it, it, it's just a point of uh, humility before the uh, overwhelming uh, status of God. He, he is above us and, and recognition of that. Uh, no one can, can, can just enter into the temple and begin to offer incense. We have examples of that in the Old Testament, and they always ended badly. Uh, when someone did something in the temple that they were not permitted to do, uh, this was, uh, of course, recognized to be sin, and we see consistently that when that happens, uh, those uh, people are punished by God. So in verse 5, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. When the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him, that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, Yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and priest and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So Christ, when he was called to be a priest, uh, he did not exalt himself. Uh, he did not uh, go to, to, to uh, take the office of a priest without... Uh, having uh, the, the calling of the Father on him. Uh, he did the office of a priest, not, not for his own sake, but for obedience's sake, because he would be a, a dear son, uh, because he, he would obey his father. And so we see that, that it doesn't say in the scripture that, that I uh, have become to you a priest or, or something like that, or I have taken to myself the, the office of a priest, but instead it says that uh, that he himself that that, that God uh, called Christ a priest forever. Uh, thou art my son; this day have I begotten thee, and thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so it says he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. He obeyed in them. Uh, he didn't. Uh, he wasn't. Uh, arrogant to approach to God. He uh, was hum uh, humble to obey God when he did the office of a priest. And this is one, one place uh, where the earthly priesthood uh, also failed uh, often. Uh, we read about Eli's sons in uh, 1 Samuel and how they were uh, arrogant and how they uh, even perverted the, uh, the rites that were supposed to be going on in the tabernacle. They were stealing from the people. They uh, believed that this was their birthright instead of submitting to God and to his, uh, his uh, calling on them and, and really his rejection of them as priests. And so in verse 9, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto them that obey him called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so he, as, as obedient, uh, he became the author of eternal salvation to the people which will obey him. Uh, the, 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 the people of Christ are marked by the fact that just as Christ obeyed, they obey him uh, also. And so we see that this is we'll see that this is not a, a condition for salvation, but it is a marker of salvation, that a, a people who uh, obey Christ uh, show themselves to be his. And so uh, we see that, uh, that they're just as Christ was obedient, they will be obedient. But the focus here, of course, is on Christ.
Christ himself. Now, uh, the, the author of Hebrews, he goes on another aside here, and he begins to run up to another warning that he gives uh, to the reader. And he starts with a little admonition about understanding these things. In verse 11, of whom, that is of Melchizedek, we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. He gives this uh, admonition. He says that, that we have a lot to say about Melchizedek, and he will say uh, a lot more later on. But uh, he, he's, he's admonishing the people, and he's admonishing us, uh, I think, in our day, uh, generally in the church, that uh, the, the, the common person in the church, and, and remembering that this is likely a sermon that's being preached to the general assembly of the church, that the church uh, has spent all of this time, generally speaking, people who, who are in the church have spent all their lives in the church, in the community of believers, uh, and yet they, they have not looked into the, these weightier matters of the scripture. Uh, and he, he admonishes that, that you've been here so long, you've been here in the church for so long, and you've listened to so, many, so much teaching going on around you, and yet you are still, as someone who, who needs milk, the milk of the word, the easy to understand things of the word, and not strong meat. Uh, and the, the reason he gives for this is that they were not using the scripture themselves. They were not uh, studying it. They were not going back to it. They were not re uh, rehearsing the things which were said to them in the church and, and trying to understand them and uh, work through these issues. And so he says that you ought to be able to teach this stuff. You ought to be able to, to, to uh, explain uh, Christ's uh, priesthood in the terms of Melchizedek, as he'll give later. Uh, but at this time, the recipients of this were in need of milk and not strong meat. Uh, but he's going to go ahead and give them the, uh, the, the scripture anyway. Uh, though he, he can't go as far as he would uh, like to because of their ignorance in the word. So chapter 6 begins, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. So he's saying that, that we have this foundation of, of basic, uh, the, the basic gospel, essentially, the, the, of repentance from dead works, that is turning away from works as a foundation for our righteousness, and instead turning to faith in Christ, of the doctrines of bapt the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands, these things being... Uh, uh, talking about ordinations, right? Baptism is an ordination ceremony. It's taken from the Old Testament. Uh, and the laying on of hands, of course, is uh, associated with uh, ministerial ordination in the New Testament. That The, the uh, laying on of the hands of the presbytery was done to uh, Timothy at his uh, ordination, at the prophecy about his ministry. And uh, of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment, that is our final hope. The resurrection. So here he says the basic gospel of trusting in Christ alone for our redemption, of service toward God in baptism and laying on of hands, and of our hope unto the end uh, that we wait for the coming of Christ. He says, let us leave these as a solid foundation. What he says is that we should have these already. We should already have the, the solid foundation of, uh, of these, these basic truths that he's 
uh, telling us. And so he says, let us move on to perfection. Let us move on to weightier things, to more mature things, to more mature teachings. In verse 4, for it is impossible, and this is what he's, he's, he's going to say, that if, if we do not have this, this weighty foundation by this point, then there is there's something wrong, and, and we uh, need to be careful uh, not to, to jump over these things. We, we should have this solid foundation and then move from there. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. So he says, if we do not have this foundation, if we're not steady, uh, if, if we do not have uh, this, uh, even though we've been among the church, uh, even if we have uh, been once enlightened, we've heard the gospel, uh, we have tasted of the heavenly gift that is, is you know, by the, 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 the preaching of the gospel and seeing how it works in others' lives and being made partakers of the blessings of the Holy Ghost in corporate uh, communion and worship and have tasted the good word of God by preaching and the powers of the world to come, again, by, by seeing that God is moving the church toward his end goal. Uh, he says, if we've seen this and we've been in this for so long and we still do not have this foundation of the gospel and, and we're not steady on it and, and we, in fact, do not have, is, is what he's getting at, we do not have the substance of the gospel, uh, it says that, that, that if they shall fall away, if they shall ultimately reject this gospel, then to renew them again to repentance, seeing they have crucified the son, uh, to themselves the Son of God afresh uh, and put him to an open shame, that this is impossible. That if after having a full knowledge of the gospel, after after understanding the 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 the, the, uh, the firmness and the power of the gospel, uh, having been in the church and ultimately rejecting it, uh, then to renew them to repentance is impossible because they have rejected Christ, who, again, the whole point of Hebrews is that Christ is superior. And so he's saying that if they have rejected the foundation of Christ, then they uh, have, have repudiated the faith. There is no more sacrifice for sin for them. So in verse 7, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them, by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you. So he's saying that just as the, the rain comes on the earth, and uh, it, it, it waters it, and it's a, a good uh, uh, place. It, it, it ought to bring forth because of the rain, just as the people ought to turn to Christ in faith because of the preaching, uh, and yet they have not. Just as the, the earth here has not, then it's nigh to cursing. Then it, uh, then it will, uh, is nigh to burning. It, its end is to be burned. It, it beareth thorns and thistles, and it is rejected. So he says that, Do not be like this field. You have heard the gospel preached often to you. You should have already been teachers, and yet you, you still have need of teaching. And he's, he is afraid that the church has, uh, has not truly got the foundation. Uh, he's saying that, that the reason that they may not be growing in in their personal devotional lives, right? In the in their their personal devotion to Christ and their understanding of the gospel, may be because they do not have the foundation, and he's afraid of that, and he's warning against that, and he says uh, to, to to be sure about this foundation so that we can go on to other things. He's he's primarily worried about whether they have believed in Christ in the first place. But in verse 9 he says, But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation 
though we thus speak. So even though he's spoken in this way, and he is warning them genuinely, he is still persuaded better things, that they, that they do have the foundation, they do have faith, but he's still warning. In verse 10, uh, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed unto, uh, toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So he, he is persuaded of things that accompany salvation. He sees their works, their their, uh, their labor of love toward God, that they, they show his uh, name in their lives. And, and so he is... He is uh, persuaded of them, but he still says, show diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. He, he wants them to, to that even, uh, you know, even though he, he doesn't think that what he said before about the dry ground receiving rain and not bringing forth, uh, uh, he, you know, even though he's, he, he's persuaded that that's not the case here, yet he still says, uh, do your diligence to, to prove full assurance. To, to be established in the foundation. And, and so he, uh, he says, be not slothful in this. In verse uh, 13, For when God made promise to Abraham, he could swear by no, uh, uh, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So this is going again off of the theme of assurance. Uh, he says that, that the assurance of Abraham, when God promised to him, was because God could swear by no greater that he swore by himself, that God gave his uh, eternal word, that, that, that he had promised to Abraham, surely blessing, I will bless thee. Uh, in verse 16, for men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, he might have a strong consolation, uh, we might have a strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay a hold upon the hope set before us. So God... Uh, gave this assurance to uh, Abraham by the promise that he had made, uh, that, that because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, that it says by two immutable things, in that it was impossible for God to lie, and because there is no greater than God, uh, that, that God gives his word, uh, that we also may have a strong assurance. Because he says that men swear by the greater thing. They swear by things that are that are higher than themselves. Uh, you know, you may hear people say that. Uh, you know, I say I swear by my fathers or something like that. Uh, well, they are swearing by their ancestors who who, who came before them, uh, who are the reason for their existing. That they're swearing by the greater. Uh, you never, uh, you know, hear somebody uh, swear by the shoes on their feet, uh, and and it mean you know, much of anything at all. Uh, that it's, that's more of just a bet that they're willing to give up their shoes if they're wrong. Uh, but if you, if you hear somebody swearing and, 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 and being serious about their oath, they swear by something greater than themselves. And so God, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by the greatest of all, that is himself. And so the, the, uh, the promise made by God is an eternal promise. It's a promise that cannot pass away. In verse 19, which hope, this hope by the promise, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the found, uh, forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And so he segues right back into this discussion about Jesus and Melchizedek. And he says, Christ is our assurance of this. He is our anchor, and he has entered into the veil. Again, going back to 
the tabernacle and the temple, the holiest place. And so in verse 17, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham running, uh, returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, uh, gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. So here he's uh, bringing up this Melchizedek figure again, and it would it would do to, to uh, list a few uh, views, different views that people have about Melchizedek. Uh, some people believe that Melchizedek was simply a priest king, uh, that he uh, was a, uh, a man that was uh, born in the time of Abraham, that he uh, was a king in uh, Salem, that is, in what would later become uh, Jerusalem, and he was a priest there also. He served a, an office in the uh, worship there, and that he served the uh, Most High God, and that he is being used here as a forerunner or, or, or a foreimaging uh, of Jesus. He's a type of Christ, in other words, in the Old Testament. And so uh, that's one view that some people have about Melchizedek. Uh, another view is that Melchizedek is not a human priest, but he is an angelic priest, and uh, that he served God uh, in uh, heaven after a heavenly priesthood. And so he uh, was given uh, dominion over the area in uh, uh, Salem that he was uh, considered spiritually a king there to to uh, have delegated authority from God and so he is uh, called a priest king there and that he is again a uh, type for Christ but not Christ himself uh, but he's he's part of a, a an angelic order of priests in which Christ uh, enters into to serve as a priest before God the final view is that this is a uh, Christophany. This is a appearance of Christ uh, in bodily form before his incarnation, and uh, this would be uh, some. This would be the kind of view that I take. We know that Jesus came as the angel of the Lord, for instance, in the Old Testament. Uh, that he did uh, even appear to Abraham at times. And it would make sense of some of the things that are said about Melchizedek here, that he was without father or mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. And so uh, it, uh, it would make sense uh, to say that this is Christ himself. But uh, whatever we take, uh, at any rate, Melchizedek is used to talk about Christ and, and to, to, to show us that Christ in his priesthood is of a priesthood that supersedes uh, the priesthood of Aaron, the, the Levitical priesthood. He is above that because he is part of a priesthood that came before Aaron. And so in verse 4, Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. So this uh, man, Melchizedek, he was uh, greater uh, than uh, Levi because he received tithes of Abraham. Uh, and Abra and uh, Levi was a descendant of Abraham. He, he came before uh, Levi. He, he, he came to Abraham, and Abraham gave tithes to him. Uh, uh, so uh, he, he is greater than uh, Abraham, and Abraham was greater than Levi. Uh, in verse 6, But he whose descent is not counted from them receiveth tithes of Abraham, and blessed him that had the promises. 
Uh, and without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men, and here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And as I may say, uh, so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek uh, met him. Uh, so there's a lot there. Uh, first is that uh, he, uh, whose descent is not counted from them, received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Uh Melchizedek was not uh, a descent with uh, Levi. He was not from Abraham, but Abraham paid tithes to him. Uh, without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. Uh, uh, and here, uh, so, so um, uh, the, the less is blessed uh, of the better. Uh, the, the better man, that is uh, Melchizedek here, he is blessing Abraham. Uh, and it shows that Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, and of course Abraham greater than Levi. Uh, and without, uh, in, in verse 8, And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them, of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. Uh, you know, men that, it says here that, that men that die receive tithes. And, and uh, I'm not personally sure exactly what this means, whether this is sort of a, a customary thing that they would do, that uh, when a man dies that uh, money would be paid maybe to the family or to uh, some you know, uh, paid anyway in honor of the dead man. Uh, and it's saying here that, that this is, is what happened in, in some way with Abraham and Melchizedek. And yet Melchizedek was alive at the time, that, that his receiving of these tithes uh, was, um, was uh, in, in a way unusual. And it, and it showed that, it, that uh, Melchizedek uh, was even greater than this tradition, that, that he received these funerary tithes, even though he was manifestly alive and blessing Abraham. And so uh, it says then, And as I may so say, Levi also, who receiveth tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Uh, Levi, uh, through the headship of Abraham over his household, uh, even Levi paid tithes. Even Aaron paid tithes to Melchizedek showing that Melchizedek's priesthood was more than the priesthood of Aaron and his sons. It was greater than the priesthood of Levi. And so uh, he, he's established here that the Levitical priesthood was lesser than the priesthood that Melchizedek was a part of. And so, uh, and so uh, going back to how he says uh, that Christ is called a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek, therefore Christ's priesthood is even better than the priesthood of Levi. He is part of a, of a more fundamental priesthood. Whether we take this to mean that Christ was Melchizedek or that he was after the same order as Melchizedek, it, it matters uh, little. Uh, the point in the passage is that Melchizedek uh, and his priesthood was better than the Levitical priesthood, and that Christ is part of that uh, that uh, priesthood of Melchizedek. And so in verse 11, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek, and not be called after the order of El, uh, Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe, of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. So he says if, 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 
if perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, why would there need to be a priest prophesied about after another priesthood? Uh, he, he's saying that the, the, that the Levitical priesthood must not be uh, able to be um, to make perfect. It, it must not be the final priesthood. It must be, in a sense, some a kind of a provisional priesthood, and that afterward there would be a a fuller priesthood after which Christ would be called. Uh, so uh, he he says uh, that uh, the priesthood of Melchizedek, the the, the prophesied uh, priest, would be uh, better than the Levitical. And even he says that the law of the the priest that comes after Melchizedek, right? The 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 order of uh, of the, the the priest that comes after would be better than the Old Testament, than than the the Levitical law, the Levitical order of doing sacrifices and such. That it would be more fundamental. It would be more efficacious. And so. He says in 15, And it is yet far more evident, for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. So it's evident that this new priest would come, and that he would not be after the law of a carnal, that is a physical commandment but the power of an endless life because of the oath that again that he says thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek uh, in verse uh, 18 then for there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof it's very strong words of the, the old covenant for the law made nothing perfect but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. He's talking about the passing away of the old because it was not profitable. It was not able to make perfect. Uh, and the bringing in of a new, by the which we may draw nigh to God. By the which we can come into his rest. In verse 20, And inasmuch as not without an oath... He was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath, by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And I think personally that, that as far as the arguments we've looked at in this section so far, this is the culmination that he's been building to. He's talked about oath giving. He's talked about how when God swears something, it is sure, it is done. And he says that those priests were not made by an oath. Uh, they were made conditionally, that if they would keep these uh, covenants, uh, if they would keep these, these uh, 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 things, then they would be priests and they could continue to be priests but as soon as they disobeyed they would be thrown out but here God makes an oath to his son in eternal promise the Lord swear and shall not repent thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek and so the oath from the father to the son to appoint the son as priest makes him so much better a priest than any man could be. Christ is the fulfillment of all priesthood because God appointed him by an oath to be priest. By so much, by all of this, was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And this is what he's going to move on to in chapter 8. But in verse 23, and they truly were many priests, that is the old priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. 
the old priests died. The old priests had a short span of time where they would be priests, but Christ lives forever and is always able to make intercession for us. And so his priesthood is able to save to the uttermost. It's able to save from all of our sins through all of our life because he ever lives to make intercession for us. In verse 26, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the sins of the pe- and then for the, sin- uh, the people. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the Son who is consecrated for evermore. And so, just as the uh, priests, uh, they they uh, uh, passed away, they also had to come in daily. They also had to enter in yearly. They had to continue to come in and. Uh, and, and, and make sacrifices. But Christ, he does this once. And this is what's going to be the, the, the next uh, few chapters is about the, the once for all sacrifice, the perfect covenant that Christ makes as our priest. And so by the oath, uh, Christ is made, uh, the, the son, he is, he is made to be consecrated as priest forevermore. And so with that, uh, we see that uh, the priesthood of Christ is greater. Uh, it's a beautiful set of chapters here. Uh, Hebrews is an amazing book, and I hope that we're all seeing that so far. Uh, and I hope that none of us think that the service that we do for God, uh, even the priestly things that we do as the priesthood of all believers, is able to stand up in comparison to the priesthood of Christ that he is the priest of our souls, and we turn to him for salvation from our sins. Uh, And I pray that all of us have, that we've looked to him. Uh, The the Lord swear and shall not repent. Thou, Christ, art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And if anyone that's listening to this uh, is turning to something else and looking uh, to their own priesthood, say to their own baptism, which is a priestly ordination. If you're looking to your own service out in the world for God, uh, and and you're you're thinking that that is able to save you, then what we've looked at here tonight uh, repudiates that. And and I, I pray that you would come and rest in Christ as your only security. And so I pray that you would come. The scripture says, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. And so I pray that you would look to Christ, the only high priest, the only God who came down and gave his life for mankind. And so with that, uh, here in a little bit, I'll be going through the next few chapters in Hebrews. Uh, Look forward to that. Uh, And uh, so, yeah, God bless.